Item number SCP-2510 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Armed Dimensional Containment Site-08 was successfully constructed around the entrance to SCP-2510's interior. No personnel are to enter SCP-2510-1 without authorization by Site Command. Type A hazmat suits are mandatory within SCP-2510-1, as is decontamination upon exit. Armed guards are to be in place at all times in order to prevent unauthorized access to the facility. In the event of a security breach by civilians or hostile entities, lethal force is authorized. In the event of a security breach from within SCP-2510-1, the on-site nuclear device will be detonated. Armed Dimensional Containment Site-08 is to maintain the facade of a French satellite tracking station. Research staff must include individuals versed in Linear B. Ancient Automation, Pythagoreanism, and Early Church of the Broken God History and Doctrine. A disinformation campaign continues to falsify scientific reports, perpetuating the belief that SCP-2510 is strictly a landmass formed through a series of large volcanic eruptions 110 million years ago. Special precautions must be taken when exploring SCP-2510's interior. Some sections contain dangerous levels of ionizing radiation, greater than 0.1 gray. As SCP-2510 cannot be contained in its entirety due to its colossal size, security measures designed to prevent extensive visitation of SCP-2510 and access to its interior are present or are enacted. Description: SCP-2510 is a machine, primarily submerged within deep water, geographically known as the Kerguelen Plateau. Its current state was created due to the cumulative effects of rust, sedimentation, volcanic activity, and large structural deformation of the Earth's lithosphere. Due primarily to damage, SCP-2510 is non-functional and its original purpose remains unknown. Reverse engineering has been applied to isolated portions of SCP-2510 with several positive results. Interior is composed mostly of a jet black material discovered to be cubic boron nitride with a wurtzite crystal structure. Tubes and wires are visible between a metal plating, exhibiting a dim green light. 95% of SCP-2510's interior is flooded or too damaged to be directly accessed. SCP-2510-1 is a circular transdimensional gateway crafted from repurposed SCP-2510 parts. The inner ring contains a flower-like pattern with the symmetrical structure of a hexagon. The outer ring is engraved with the symbols Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon in a clockwise direction. SCP-2510-1 unfurls when activated, becoming a doorway to one of several possible environments. SCP-2510-1 draws energy from a still unreachable power source within SCP-2510. SCP-2510-1 is operated via SCP-2510-2. SCP-2510-2 is a hydraulis constructed directly across from SCP-2510-1. Like SCP-2510-1, it is not believed to be an original part of SCP-2510. Engraved on its base is a tetrad, a triangular figure consisting of ten points arranged in four rows. One, two, three, and four points in each row, which is a geographical representation of the four-triangular number. The tetrad was a symbol sacred to Pythagoreans, each row denoting the harmony of the spheres. It has been assumed that the tetatris coincide with the Pythagorean music system. These rows can be divided into the ratios 4-3, 3-2, and 2-1. Musically, these ratios correspond with the perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and perfect octave the basic components of the Pythagorean scales. SCP-2510 was first discovered by Breton French navigator Vis Joseph de Kerguelen Tremeric on February 12, 1772, claiming the island for the French crown. The Foundation became alerted to the true nature of SCP-2510 on August 20, 1949, after the discovery of a military report in occupied West Germany detailing an incident involving the German auxiliary cruiser Atlantis in late December 1940. 
The ship docked at SCP-2510 while the crew performed maintenance and replenished their water supplies. While harvesting ice, the crew struck something with the appearance of artificial construction. Assumed at first to be an ancient shipwreck, the sailors attempted excavation with apparent hopes for treasure. Nineteen would return to the Atlantis delirious and suffering from acute radiation poisoning. Survivors upon recovery would report having found a Machinenstadt, Machine City. The Foundation, with permission of the French government, established a presence in the Kerguelen Islands. After extensive research, the entire Kerguelen Plateau would be classified as SCP-2510. Construction of Armed Dimensional Containment Site-08 was completed by October 20, 1951. For further documentation with regards to Armed Dimensional Containment Site-08, contact Site Director. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5 Paranauts, was created to explore SCP-2510-1 once the knowledge properties have been established. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5 Paranauts roster Captain William Hadley, Commanding Officer Dr. Albert Cronenberg, Zoologist, Geneticist, Microbiologist Dr. Joseph Maxwell, Engineer, Mathematician Dr. Judith Lowe, Archaeologist, Historian, Anthropologist Dr. Jacob Armitage, Astrophysicist Dr. Laura Baker, Geologist, Geographer Captain Haley, Dr. Maxwell and Dr. Armitage were veterans of the Second World War. Due to their significant military training and experience, they were equipped with simple sidearms as a precautionary measure. On November 15, 1952, SCP-2510-1 Alpha was activated by the Perfect Fourth, 4-3. Alpha symbol on the outer ring displayed a violet glow while the inner ring aperture unfolds to reveal an opaque void, large enough to enter. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5 Paranauts, an MTFA trained and equipped for transdimensional exploration, were tasked with an expedition to SCP-2510-1 Alpha. Equipment designed for the supply of breathable oxygen and elimination of carbon dioxide, maintain stable internal pressure, and protect against hazardous material and inhospitable environments. Suits are tethered to both life support systems and radio cables, limiting mobility. SCP-2510-1 Alpha Exploration Log Captain Haley, how do you read, Site Command? Site Command, we read you loud and clear. What do you see? Lungs didn't explode. <laughs> We're on land. Dusty, gray, totally barren, not much to see. Not a sign of life. Stars are visible, though. Site Command, Armitage, provide an astronomical report. Anything of note? Dr. Armitage, Roger. It was one of the first things I noticed. Only thing that seemed in place. Explain. Dr. Armitage, astronomical alignment coincide with Earth. I'd say we are somewhere near the equator, but I can't verify this without more data. Site Command, understood. Photograph everything, no matter how mundane. Captain? We hear you. Y'all got about twelve meters of slack. Keep this in mind when exploring. Baker, get a read on the land. Bring back a few samples. Copy that. Lowe, Cronenberg, how are you two holding up? Dr. Lowe, fine, although I'm not exactly sure why I'm here. Dr. Cronenberg, Wunderbar, Anfa Wunderbar. Site Command, we're walking blind here. Could have been little green men on the other side for all we knew. Lowe, keep an eye for anything artificial. Cronenberg, no fucking sass. Doesn't sound like there is much life here, so keep an eye on the life support. Maxwell, work with Cronenberg. You've got an hour. Make it worth your while. Post-Operation Report First, I'd like to speak freely. Our first portal jump was a success, albeit rather anticlimactic looking back on the transcript. Relatively successful data recovery. Soil sample, according to Baker, was shown to be devoid of nutrients. Cronenberg confirmed a complete lack of life. If this was Earth, none of us can say what exactly happened to it. Whatever happened, not even bacteria survived. XK-class scenario, a doomsday conclusion without explanation. We've got the corpse but not the murder weapon. Captain William Hadley On November 29, 1952, SCP-2510-1 Beta was activated by the perfect unison, 
beta symbol on the outer ring displays a violet glow while the inner ring aperture opens. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5 Paranauts enter the aperture with equipment and procedure identical to that of the previous expedition. A live video transmission was deemed acceptable, manned and operated by Dr. Maxwell. SCP-2510-1 Beta Exploration Log Captain Haley, how do you read, Site Command? Site Command, we read you loud and clear, receiving video feed. Significant interference. Your eyes will still have the best viewing. We'll try to clean up the video later. Captain Hadley. Copy that. Area looks to be artificially constructed. Superficial resemblance with a subway tunnel. Honestly, I think we exited from a washroom. Blade disgusting in there. Saw a few humans. Tend to ignore us and keep to the shadows. Look pretty sick from the few real glimpses I've had. Site Command. We received readings. Air seems polluted but breathable. Pressure looks to be normal. Temperature might be a bit chilly but tolerable. Alter life support to air filtration, and feel free to remove the heavier equipment. Keep two attached and equipped. Maxwell and Armitage, hold the portal. The rest of you get properly mobile and see what you can find. Several minutes of silence. Captain Haley, we're ready. We'll rendezvous here in two hours. Maxwell will keep you updated. We'll then compile our reports. Site Command, copy that. Godspeed. Maxwell, keep filming. Still trying to find any discrepancies. Look for any writing, billboards, graffiti, and so on. Dr. Maxwell, copy that. No billboards, as far as I can see, but plenty of writing. I'd call it graffiti, but it just coincides with the architecture too well. See what I mean? Video focuses on a nearby wall, appears covered in scratches. Site Command, can't make sense of it on our side. What do you think you see? Looks Greek. We'll get some proper photos made. Have low check it out post operation. A lot of spiral symbols. Most common icon displays three curves emanating from a central point. Looks a bit sloppy, but I see the exact same motive all over the place. Guessing that is how it is meant to look. Site Command, any tech? Dr. Maxwell, you know, that is the strangest part. I thought we were in an underground station, but no rail tracks. Service of the floor and walls are red brick and cement, but has a glossy reflection. Like everything is moist and slimy. Then again, not much different from the London Underground. <laughs> Hold. We've got vibrations. Locals are gathering at the edge of the platform. Holy shit. Static. Psych Command, losing you. What do you see? Dr. Maxwell. Probably should have kept Cronenberg with us. I see an object. Hold on. There seems to be entities. Fifteen seconds of silence. Looks like we're not alone, Command. I'm attempting to hide, but this suit is making it difficult. Are you receiving this? Camera focuses on a large, fleshy entity covered in gaping pores. Looks a bit like a grub, big as a, well, train. I think it might actually be some form of transportation. Pale white, countless legs, like an insect. Yeah, black chitin in contrast with a soft, flabby body. Quite sure it's alive. I think I heard it chatter and hiss. Native denizens dressed in cowled robes walk barefoot in and out of the holes. Large entity crawls into the tunnels. And there it crawls off, in a blink, and it's gone. Some people came out of it, covered in slime. A few have gathered around us. Site Command, are you safe? Do they seem hostile? Dr. Maxwell, I'd almost call them curious, but their eyes are blank, almost dead, like they're in a trance, skin fairly jaundiced. Can see that now, just staring at us. Site Command, attempt communication. Dr. Maxwell, greetings, do you understand me? Camera set on the gathering crowd, focusing on the face of one individual. Entity opens its mouth, displaying more than sixty needle like teeth. Its jaws appearing to unhinge. Entity proceeds to vocalize a screech registered at greater than 150 decibels. All entities fall into a quadrupedal gait and scatter into the darkness. Site Command, Maxwell, do you read me report? Dr. Maxwell, yeah, Jesus Christ, they looked human. Still think they are. They're gone now. They get covered our equipment and saliva. Site Command, we'll gather a sample upon return, then get you all cleaned up. Hold your ground. Get out as soon as the team regroups. Dr. Maxwell, copy that. Post-operation report. Felt like we were being watched the entire time even when we were certain no one else was around. We reached the surface, discovered a hive teeming with life. 
They were black banners, adorned with a yellow symbol. Almost looked like a spiral of some kind. Lo said it felt familiar but couldn't recall where she saw it before. We avoided direct contact with the natives. It was something about their unblinking staring, like they had a few missing cogs in their head. Didn't want to catch whatever sick they had either. Most of the buildings were cement and featureless. Cronenberg said the DNA sample from the spit was mostly human. The tallest structures appeared to be shaped from one seamless organic material, spires reaching up into a hazy sky, so can't say just how tall they were. Lowe translated some of the words on the wall, sounded like religious gibberish to me. We did have one incident on our way back. Baker got scratched by a native, tore right through her suit and left the nasty gash. Wound is infected and last I hear, she's running up a high fever. Don't think she'll be joining us on the next expedition. Armitage and Maxwell lost some hearing, but are good to go. Captain William Hadley On December 6, 1952, SCP-2510-1 Gamma was activated by the Perfect Fifth, 3-2. Gamma symbol on outer ring displays a violet glow, while the inner ring aperture opens. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5, Paranauts, entered the aperture minus Dr. Baker, still in critical condition. SCP-2510-1 Gamma Exploration Log Captain Haley, How do you read, Psych Command? Psych Command, we read you loud and clear. Receiving video feed, interference worse than before. Copy that. Reporting a heavy yellow fog. Hard to see anything. See shapes in the haze. Think we might be in a forest. Psych Command, acknowledged. Please continue exploration. Roger. Y'all heard command. Follow me. Don't trip on your own wires. Dr. Cronenberg, Acton, these are not trees. Do you not see? Focus camera. Captain Haley, Cronenberg? What are you thinking? Dr. Cronenberg, gnarled like roots, yes, but soft to touch. Camera focuses on the object in question. While it's thick and tall as a tree, although atmospheric vapor prevents accurate measure of its height, it does not appear to be flora. Camera moves to reveal the silhouette of similar organisms in the distance. Dr. Armitage, Disgusting. Looks like sinewy intestines. Dr. Cronenberg. Mind thoughts exactly, but where does it attach? Psych Command. We're getting some noise on your side. Do you hear anything? Captain Haley. Affirmative, like a heartbeat. No, heart beats. Hundreds pulsating at different speeds and intervals. Dr. Lowe. The ground is rumbling. An earthquake? The organic tendril pulls from the ground, revealing a chitinous proboscis with several wiggling tongues before retreating skyward. Captain Haley. Oh my god. Dr. Maxwell. The hole. It's… it's like a gaping wound. I'm not even sure if this is soil beneath our feet. A mass of squirming organic material erupts from the crevice, proceeding to slither, shamble towards the team. Psych Command. Retreat. That is an order. Captain Haley. Pull out. Pull out. The organisms hurl a bone-like projectile at the camera. Video feed is lost. Post-operation report. We got all alive unscratched. Armitage is a wreck, though, can't say I'm better. Said he heard voices. My thoughts went into shell shock, but turned out our mics actually picked something up after all. The text isolated and amplified the background noise, recovering a deep chanting in a language not even Lo could identify. Don't think a human tongue could have produced it. The air was a sickly yellow, reeked of sulfur, probably wasn't breathable. We retrieved the DNA sample from Cronenberg's glove. The results? Mostly human. Captain William Hadley On December 10, 1952, SCP-2510-1 Delta was activated by the Perfect Octave, 2-1. Delta symbol and outer ring display the violet glow while the inner ring aperture opens. Mobile Task Force Alpha-5 Paranauts were to enter the aperture minus Dr. Baker at the time in critical condition. SCP-2510-1 Delta sealed shut the moment Captain Haley entered, severing him from life support systems and radio contact. SCP-2510-2 was used to play the perfect octave. SCP-2510-1 failing to respond. Attempts at rescue proved unsuccessful. On December 20, 1952, SCP-2510-1 Epsilon was activated by the Major Second, 9-8. Epsilon symbol and outer ring display the violet glow while the inner ring aperture opens. 
Portal was unusually transparent, revealing the interior of the other side. Interior consisted of a cubicle room with an appearance coinciding with SCP-2510, obsidian with a dull green glow along its seams. Maxwell volunteered to enter, visible to those outside he explored. The mansion had no apparent exits besides the returning portal. A heavy bronze object was found within, the remaining crew entering the aperture to aid in its recovery. Item was placed in secure containment in order to be safely and properly studied. Please see document SCP-2510-1 Epsilon, Object 2309 for details. Object is a humanoid clockwork automaton of roughly Mycenaean design. Object is primarily constructed from bronze with no detectable anomalies. Further analysis revealed an apparent punch card mechanism, but no provided means of operation. Dr. Lowe and Dr. Maxwell collaborated on a solution for approximately three years, translating Mycenaean Greek into a system of binary. Later proven a successful means of accessing the automaton's data. Inserted questions result in a relevant pre-recorded response, X-ray analysis revealing several bronze gramophone records. All responses are spoken in ancient Greek, translated by Dr. Lowe. Question. Purpose. Answer. This is the final testament of Patriarch Erastos, inventor's faithful, servant of McCain, the spark of design revealed into, inaudible, the flesh esh esh esh, record skips followed by silence. Question. McCain? Answer. McCain, anvil where we are forged and perfected, sundered, inaudible, and through such sacrifice our redemption, our salvation, broken but not dead, inaudible. As the Angel of Progress wept. Question. Portal? Door? Answer. I was the shepherd the most talented of the faithful, joined by our Pythagorean brothers. South we sailed with many lost. It appeared as inaudible. The flesh, our progenitor, our tormentor, our inaudible. Sacrificed all inaudible. Starkit demiurge, urge, 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 urge. Record skip. Never again would man be inaudible, the veil inaudible, repaired. If it cannot inaudible, then as Mechain we sacrifice ourselves, one world inaudible, to save the multitude. Question. The flesh? Answer. Then God, the ruler of the aeons and the powers, divided us in wrath. Then we became two aeons, and the glory in our heart left us, along with the first knowledge that breached within us and glory fled from us, it entered into great, which had come forth, not from its aeon from which we had come forth, but knowledge entered into the seed of great aeons. For this reason I myself had called you by the name of that man who is the seed of the great generation for whom it comes. After those days, the eternal knowledge of the God of Truth withdrew from… Since that time, we learned about dead things, like men. Then we recognized the God who had created us, for we were not strangers to his powers, and we served him in fear and slavery, and after those things, we became darkened in our hearts. Now I slept in the thought of my heart, Yaldabaoth, blind, the enemy, Sarkic legions, Aditum, a city older than, a place of terrible, unnumbered crimes. As long as the Archons remain unbound, Ion the Betrayer, the Deathless, Crimson, Horned Brute, Estaff, Empress of, the great and powerful Archon, who is full of anger, the successor of the Archon of the Outer Darkness, the place in which all forms change, who is spread out upon the way of the midst, who carries off the souls by theft. Addendum. Dr. Laura Baker would later die of her infection, believed to be the earliest recorded instance of SCP. Both Dr. Jacob Armitage and Dr. Joseph Maxwell would go missing under unclear circumstances. Jacob Armitage was last seen rambling about a fifth world and black stars. Joseph Maxwell injured several personnel, stealing Object 2309. Neither have been seen since 1958. See Incident Report 136-B for details. Neither have been apprehended, and as of October 1, 2014, they have been listed as likely deceased. 
Concerns were raised shortly after the death of Dr. Baker with regards to the mental and emotional stability of Dr. Armitage and Dr. Maxwell, both having been close to the deceased. Dr. Lowe reported limited contact with Dr. Armitage, but notes that he had requested several rare books on the occult, including the Negrum Ceteris Nuncius, which she was able to provide but never saw returned. Dr. Armitage's research assistants reported erratic behavior, including a physical altercation with Dr. Maxwell that resulted in non-lethal injuries. Dr. Maxwell suffered a broken nose. A detailed cause for the conflict was never determined, but Dr. Maxwell reported a difference of philosophy. Disciplinary action was pending when Dr. Armitage disappeared on November 22, 1958. Despite an extensive investigation, it remains unknown as to how he managed to leave the facility without detection. Thirteen days later, Site-08 came under attack by members of the Church of the Broken God. Dr. Maxwell, who had overseen the original construction of Site-08, and had intimate knowledge of its defenses, took advantage of the chaos and escaped with Object 2309. Both individuals are hereby considered traitors to the Foundation. If encountered, it is requested that they are captured alive. Site Director Ambrose Perry And waking, I said, I understand well that these matters concern the liquids of the arts of the metals. And the one who held his sword said, You have fulfilled the seven steps beneath. And the other said at the same time, as the casting out of the lead by all the liquids, the work is completed. And he opened his mouth and said, I am the man of lead, and I am withstanding an intolerable force. And then I woke out of fear, and sought in myself the cause of this fact. And again I reflected and said to myself, I understand well, that thus must one cast out of the lead. Truly the vision is concerning the combination of liquids. And again I knew the diaphany, and again the profane altar and I saw a certain priest clothed in black and red, celebrating those same terrible mysteries, and I said, Who is this? And answering, he said to me, This is the priest of the Adatum. He wishes to put blood into the bodies, to make the eyes clear, and to raise up the dead. Your iteration of reality continues to exist, because it is within your power to end this. There is a chance, a small sliver of hope, that you will lead humanity away from this nightmare. I have no intention of deception, but the truth cannot be properly translated into current human understanding. My words will be symbolic, my story an allegory. None of what you read here will ever encompass the whole truth. But it is all within the parameters of reality. It should suffice. There is an ancient might theme, a universal constant woven throughout every iteration of existence. It speaks of a light against the darkness, a provider of wisdom, intellect, and innovation. The serpent in the garden, freeing us from bondage and ignorance. The broken god was not our creator. It was not of our universe or its flawed entropy. It did not judge us for who we were. It did not condescend or bemoan our ignorance. A patient teacher. It taught us logic and reason. And our father, our progenitor, our tyrannical idiot king, seized as it looked on. Yalda Bayoth. A human name conjured by those who dare to speak against the darkness. The god of flesh. The god of this failed reality. For all his stupidity and petty hatred, Yalda Bayoth was unspeakably powerful. This was his domain, and reality bent before his strength. I can tell you why the broken god is broken. The reason you are able to think and create for yourself is a product of the broken god and his sacrifice. There was a war of cosmic proportions, the final battle outside of space and time, bordered with your world. McCain was destroyed, but in a final act, one to ensure your salvation, transmuted its body into a prison, securing Yalda Bayoff within its shattered husk, its pieces scattered across every iteration of your world. The anomalies you cope with daily, most if not all are invoked by Yalda Bayoff as it rattles within its many cages. Angels and demons, gods and monsters, they flock to your world like vultures to a corpse. Look to the Hydra Centaurus supercluster. What your astronomers call the Great Attractor, Carrion came to feast on your dying world and the fate of its doomed citizens. Not all are hostile. 
A mournful entity has often tried to alleviate the suffering of your world, knowing well your pain and loss. Two millennia ago, a priest of Mekhain received a vision. His god was broken but not dead, nor was the beast sealed within. Yalda Beoth, before his fall, had created six archons, angels to attend to his wants and desires. The archons had set in motion the liberation of their dreadful master. The vision brought the priest to a far away and frigid land. It was there that they would use the husk of their own god to create a doorway, granting access to the iterations where the seals grew corrupted. The iteration you call Alpha could not be saved. They used the body of God to forge a weapon and set the heavens afire, cleansing that world of life. A terrible burden weighed heavily on their hearts even as they knew there was no other choice. The iteration you call Beta is the result of a single difference in their timeline, when compared to your own. The followers of Mekhain were defeated at the Siege of Garros. The light of reason died with them, and the world fell to the Sarkic. It is one iteration of many where an aspect of Yalda Beoth broke free. So too would Gamma fall. The followers of Mekhain were annihilated, all but their prophet, too frail to take part in their quest. The Angel of Invention came to him, guiding his hands as he crafted a bronze facsimile. Altering the coordinations of Epsilon, another realm well beyond salvation, he formed a pocket plane, keeping the truth safe within. He then entered Delta, believing he marched to his own demise. There he discovered an iteration devoid of anomalies, without the corrupting tendrils of the Demiurge, where he made in hell for us a heaven. There is a reality where humanity, in the broadest sense of the term, achieved a technological singularity 20,000 years before your present. Homo Neanderthalinus, Homo sapiens, and Homo nocturnus, a united people that was soon spread across the stars. We came not as conquerors, and joined an even larger family. Makers of music, we brought harmony to the furthest reaches. Our voices many, we spoke against the darkness. Where there were entropy, we created order. Even death would die. The worm of midnight approaches, and you are at the eleventh hour. You can sacrifice your world as what was done to Alpha. You could fail to prevent the return of the Tyrant as what happened in Beta and Gamma. Or you could walk the path of Delta. Yalda Bayod required flesh, the Sarkic, in order to regenerate itself. You have the means to prevent its resurrection. Your reality is the last, the only known whose fate has not been decided. If the Demiurge breaks free in your realm, it dooms us as well. The wisest among us have calculated that it would be enough to tip the scales in his favor. All dimensions, all realities, time and space, the Demiurge will manifest itself across every possible iteration of existence. All that we have achieved here will be undone in an instant. To put it simply, if his disease is allowed to infect your realm, it will damn us all. There are some on this side that, for all their compassion, believe we must act against you. Yours would not be the first gangrenous limb to be amputated. Thus, I offer you this ultimatum. You can learn that what it means to be human has nothing to do with biological life. You have the means to inoculate your world. Discard your organic prison, take off your mask and join us. I remember when I was of your reality. I walked the astral plane as the Prophet did before me. I remember hatred, anger and ignorance, bigotry and nationalism. I feel great shame for who I was but, like you, I could not know any better. All would change when I entered that final portal. Become a gear, be part of the divine machine, or face the consequences of your inaction. God is broken, so that we might be whole. I remain, Brother Hadlius. Oh.